Good morning, and thank you for joining me for um, our first program for our Pueblo in the Roaring Twenties exhibit that will be coming up very soon through the Special Collections and Museum Services Department. I am Bree Pappen, a Museum Services Specialist here at the Rollins Library, and um, I wanted to today bring you a visual of you know, some of the elements we're going to talk about in the exhibit. Um, this exhibit will be um, virtually on the www.publolibrary.org website um, through May, possibly through June. So we're very excited about this new exhibit. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about it first. Um, this exhibit will look at many aspects of this truly historical decade in Pueblo, from its recovery after World War I, the Spanish flu pandemic, and the city's move into the modern age. Pueblo demonstrated resilience and prospered, recovered from natural disasters, and persevered as a gateway to modern life and innovation in the Rocky Mountain region. So I'm just going to take you through a, a timeline, a visual timeline, to demonstrate some of the things that we talk about in the exhibit, and also to show the transition that many were making at this time from the later Victorian and into the Edwardian period, period moving into the modern era, the deco period, um, in the United States in the late, late 20s to early 30s. So let's just get started here. So I'm bringing examples from my personal collection. Um, I'm a bit of an amateur fashion historian. I love uh, collecting stories about these items and finding out how they fit into modern life or our lives. Um, and it shows how um, innovative uh, we were um, as a population in terms of fashion, in terms of use. Um, so I wanted to bring, uh, first of all, a really nice example of uh, Victorian era piece. Just to give you an idea of how it fits. Um, the main characteristics of Victorian era going into the Edwardian era was um, very decorative, highly ornate, um, over the top. Um, everything was flourished and embellished. Um, this was um, a characteristic of the Victorian era, Queen Victoria in England. Um, everything was exponentially um, over the top. Um, very ornate. So, um, things like clothing reflected that. Um, this is made of all silk. Um, it's a silk charmeuse silk process. And these were, this is entirely handmade. There is no machine involved in this at all. Um, so, this has um, aurora borealis and iridescent beads, most likely gotten by the person that made this in. Her um, kind of Ashley store, or millinery store, or dry goods store. Um, these would have been imported from either Czechoslovakia or West Germany at the time where these beads were being manufactured. Um, they're all glass beads. So um, you can really see the intricate work. This person, who was obviously expert, seamstress. Um, but again, this is all silk charmeuse. Um, and then on the inside, it's a cotton muslin material, always used for linings, used for under layers. Um, silk was always the, the final top layer or the outside layer, um, or linen at the time. Um, again, all hand sewn, and fasteners were usually hook and eyes or snaps. Um, again, made of metal. Um, so all, only natural occurring textiles, silks, linens, um, cotton, and uh, they were discovering different processes to create finishes. Um, so silk charmeuse as opposed to like a silk chiffon or a sheer. So. Um, and again, this is, again, this is later. So um, 18, late 1830s, 1840s through 1900 is Victorian era usually. Um, high neck, um, Modesty was the 
overall intent of dressing. Um, no skin was showing, not even hands. Um, gloves were worn at all times. Um, your hair, hair was usually long um, and tied up. Um, and the hats at the time were very large brimmed, ornate, embellishment, silk ribbon, silk flowers, um, sometimes imported from France. Um, so this was a very special occasion made. Outfit. Um, so I'm going to say, you know, late 1800s, early 1901 to 25. So moving later into the Edwardian period, um, again, we still have certain elements of a high neck, full sleeve, um, less embellishment, but this was a not as a fancy um, blouse. Um, this may have been for everyday wear. Um, mutton sleeves. Mountain, which was like a uh, really popular silhouette at that time. Um, again, all silk, only natural occurring fabrics existed. Um, and this would have been a daytime, every day, working, being in the house, doing whatever outfit, um, maybe even working outside. Um, and then this is an example of, this is all cotton, this is a, a petticoat slip or maybe a second layer. There would have been probably another layer under this. Um, same with Victorina, many layers to invoke um, modesty, dressing in layers. Um, and then, so this would have popped, this is more of a petticoat slip, so this would have been worn under the top layer. Most likely this, the skirt would have been silk to match. Again, this is all hand done. Um, and then an interesting element of this particular is that there were metal stays, silk wrapped metal stays that the person that made this did. Um, these were very common in the Edwardian era clothing um, and was the sign of a, an experienced seamstress, a master seamstress, um, to put the metal stays so the collar stayed up. Um, so pretty innovative in my mind um, in terms of creating that master silhouette. Again, only has the hook and eye closures, no zippers at this time. Um, even in menswear, uh, button fly was it with no zippers. Also, here's an example of a probably Edwardian, so 1900 through 1910 era or so, uh, glove, all woven from cotton. Um, so this definitely would have been worn together, going out, um, perhaps even carried a purse. All uh, woven. This most likely was, this is a replica However, it's really accurate replica of a late Victorian, early Edwardian. This would have been most likely store-bought. Um, there were lots of home-sewn um, kits that you could buy, but this particular one it was a, is a replica of a, um, a store-bought one, and it would have been um, all hand-embroidered. Um, so this most likely is a you know, pretty accurate representation of Edwardian period, which ran through 1910. Um, at this time, at the time in, um, in America, um, lots of influence from Great Britain and Europe through the Victorian era, through the Edwardian period, and then especially coming into this next era, which is called 1910 to 1920, is um, the arts and crafts movement. The arts and crafts movement started in the very late 1880s, 1890s in Great Britain. Um, examples of this are William Morris. William Morris was a famed English um, designer. 
and he's best known for um, his hand uh, hand painted wallpapers and designs. He's what we would now refer to as a graphic designer, um, and very well known designs um, carried over to the United States. At the same time, um, modernist movement was starting to take shape, and um, art movements at the time were moving towards Cubism uh, and brutalism, um, more refined, less ornate, um, less romanticized um, than maybe the pre-Raphaelite era of the Edwardian period, um, also coming from Great Britain. Um, but as things were moving to America, things were being kind of retranslated. Um, so the 1910 to 1920 era um, is moving more towards a streamline um, in design, in art, in lifestyle, also in music, also in fashion. So uh, now we're going to look um, at more of the era of what um, our exhibit focus is, is um, the 20s era, which was considered um, very innovative kind of a flip-flop, 180 of what was taking place at the time. Um, you see floor length, fashion, modesty, transform into the complete opposite, um, skin showing, um, frivolity, living life to the fullest, living in the moment. These were the ideals um, that were put forth um, to popular society, um, coming out of Paris, coming out of um, New Orleans and the Deep South um, in terms of uh, the grasping of jazz music at this time. Um, Django Weinhardt was probably at the, he was considered at the height of um, modern era. He was a, a gypsy from Europe, Eastern European gypsy, who came to, started in France, but then came to America to introduce his notion of jazz music to Basp and New Orleans and the South. And, um, so meccas such as New York and Chicago, highly populated areas, um, grasp this immediately for um, the new era, post-World War I. People wanted to just kind of move forward and forget about the past after World War I, the Great War, and they were ready to be modern, grass modernism, and um, just take life by the horns, basically, um, as Scott Fitzgerald, Thomas Hemingway, um, put forth a lot of these notions to the public. Um, so I'm going to start with an um, interesting piece of menswear. Um, this is a boater hat, all hands handmade, hand-woven straw um, with a silk ribbon. This is probably later 20s, but this is high fashion, high daytime fashion for men. Um, usually worn with white linen suit, um, striped shirt, striped tie to match the, the hat ribbon. Um, so this is a really nice example, again, probably later 20s, possibly early 30s. Um, by Bupool. Um, Bupool Straw Hats, really mainstream company, established in 1926. Um, so this tells you about when this may have been um, manufactured. When I say manufactured, I mean made. Um, again, things were still being made by hand, um, but moving into the modern era, innovation in materials were being made every day. But um, this is a really cool example of a men's boater hat uh, from the late 20s. Then um, also women's, women's wear. Um, as I mentioned before, the style of women's hats were really large, brimmed hats, ornate ribbons, florals, netting, um, really over the top. Um, all of this scaled down, moving into the 20s, um, towards the 
end of the 20s um, with the streamlining of fashion, with the streamlining of um, interiors, design, um, the whole all that all looked, women's look changed as well. Um, highly influenced by fashion, highly influenced by um, uh, movies, which were um, really taking hold of America. Um, still silent movies moving into the early 20s, but by the mid 20s, um, talking movies started to make their debut and um, certain um, movie stars, such as Louise Brooks, who was considered the it girl, the flapper it girl, um, completely modern take on women. Um, also remember 1920 women gained the national vote and there was a liberation of sorts for women. So they um, really took hold of feminism, really took hold of the opportunities uh, that presented themselves. Um, many women found themselves or, um, in political offices um, especially in Colorado, being one of the first states um, to grant women's right to vote, um, to mediate suffrage. Um, so, um, some of these examples today are from Colorado. Um, so, that's really exciting to be able to share that with you as well. So, moving into that whole streamlining of culture, um, one thing that dictated hat design, for example, or women's haircuts. Uh, women were cutting off long hair and going to their local barbers, street barbers, and asking them for a bob or um, a flapper bob. And it was a short cropped um, kind of page boy, cut all the same, but maybe has waves on top. So very short cropped haircut. Um, and so therefore that moved towards that uh, particular style completely dictated the redesigning of the hat in terms of um, enhancing your, your face looks. Um, so shorter cropped, complete departure from huge wide brimmed over the top lavish hats. Um, so this was a more compact streamlined look um, I'll put it on the mannequin so you can get more of an idea of how how the overall look was desired. So you see that you have a, a cropped, um, cropped hair, hat enhanced the hair, and then streamlined, very clean line, um, dress, day dress. This is a day dress. Um, Silk chiffon with, uh, underneath it has a cotton muslin slip, very much like still using the same materials. Um, again, all natural fibers were only available. There was no synthetics um, until probably very late 20s, early 30s, because they just started experimenting with synthetics about that very early time, early 30s time. So again, cotton muslin, silk chiffon, cotton velvets, um, really um, kind of a close silhouette. Um, uh, boyish silhouette was most desirable in women. Um, many women were still wearing undergarments at the time, so they would, uh, so they could achieve that look. More of a straight, streamlined to go. I mean, so it just was kind of the ultimate. culture um, in the previous where it was very curvaceous. Um, this is more straight streamlined. Um, but this is an average and then close pearls. Um, a respectable flapper would have if a girl was moving into that the flapper movement, um, which was another you know, movement that's just completely separate from that together. Um, it was a real um, comment on women's liberation. Um, she would have yards and yards and yards of pearls. Um, and this kind of showed her her level in society. 
Um, real pearls, of course. Um, these are not real, but these are 20s era you know, necklace. Um, uh, these are hollowed out. So these are probably with metal. Um, and metal here. Um, but again, we have silk chiffon. Have an insert of um, silk fabric with a uh, vegetable dye, block print. So again, all created by hand. And layers and we have, and, and again, no fasteners, this just slips over the head. So simplicity. This is a really prime example of a daytime look. Um, also, in terms of um, handbags, they were very small. Um, this is an example of metal mesh. It was made in the USA, but um, probably the most well-known manufacturer was Wade & Davis, which was a started out as a um, silver-making company in Great Britain, and then moved to the United States and um, expanded into all kinds of things: compacts, purses, clothing. This is probably later 20s. All silk inside and silk. Another example, and this is very early plastic. It's celluloid. Um, so this probably would have been at the very earliest, 1929, but most likely early 30s. But it's an example of um, what would have been worn towards the end of the 20s era. And this would um, have been used in several ways um, to be used as a pin. Or on a hat, or on a coat. Um, one thing to remember is that uh, in 1929, in October, the stock market crashed. And moving into the 30s era, um, the unemployment rate and poverty level in the United States just plummeted. Um, it just, it's, unemployment was rampant. Um, so something like this to a lady who um, maybe didn't have a whole lot at the time um, could be more versatile to her um, as she could use it in multiple ways. So um, this is something that's later 20s, I'm going to say probably early 30s, but um, Early in, um, notions of this would have been made in metal, um, and it would have been like a pot metal, more inexpensive uh, metal, probably not sterling, um, but still that it had rhinestones, um, like the stones in Czechoslovakia. So this is a really interesting piece, it's kind of a turning point. Also, um, kind of essential in the flapper wardrobe was a cigarette holder. The longer, the better. Um, so this would have been part of the flapper's wardrobe. She would have um, had this on her at all times, um, using a cigarette. Um, it just was a sign. The longer the cigarette holder, um, the higher on the social ladder she was. So um, this is a replica, but very indicative of what would have been present at that time. Here's another example more. Um, this is more era appropriate as to flapper dress. Um, again, streamlined, um, ruffles, shorter, silk shamus, also. Has kind of the, the streamlined silhouette. Um, perfect for dancing, perfect for frolicking, which is what flappers were going to do. Um, somebody decided that this was gotten in northern New Mexico, actually. I guess at a later time, somebody put a metal zip on it. But it would have been slip over the head, much like this one. Very easy to find. Um, another uh, pastime of 
modern modern ladies at their time was lounging. So um, known for known back in the Victorian Edwardian times as um, lounging became, was kind of a pastime for ladies of wealth, uh, ladies in social climbing, um, painting couches, laying in their, in their entryways. Um, but lounging was taken to a whole new level. Um, kind of the Bohemian um, modern women uh, would have you know, lounging pajamas, which were actually always used made of silk. Um, silks imported from Japan. Japanese silks were considered the height of, um, of uh, this era and uh, were the most sought after. Um, Ponji silks, which were um, vegetable dyed hand block silks from Japan, um, were the most desirable. Um, unfortunately, I don't have an example of that today, but um, I'm going to show you an example of lounging attire that would have um, been pretty common. So, this would have been an example. Uh, this is a, called a step-in. And um, all silk, embroidered. Um, this was store-bought as a manufacturer's tag here. Um, and this was had like a shorts, like tap shorts. So um, this would have just been, that's why it was called a step in. Um, this would have been worn all the way as in a slip under thing. Definitely most of them said going to that or this. Um, and then um, as they were dressing, they would wear this with um, a kanji robe or a kimono, which were also um, really sought after items for women who lounged women in their wardrobe. Um, and then they would have, this is also sleeping attire. So it kind of ran the gamut. Um, but these would have anything from like, long pants, matching shorts, um, lace embellished um, robe or bed jacket. Um, but most likely, um, majority of women would have had a kimono to wear over it. This is a little later era, um, probably 30s, but really similar to the style that they would have worn. Um, this is silk from Japan, um, but this would have been indicative of uh, lounging. I want to talk a little bit about um, purse bags, which was um, one of the most well-known um, family-run department stores here in Pueblo for many, many years, um, up through the 70s, uh, early to mid-1880s through the 1970s. So an incredible run, um, but uh, purse bags, um, and I will have images of purse bags in the 1920s, um, on the exhibit, so really fun, but um, this is a really great example of cruise bags hat box um, that this hat came in. So um, I'm excited that they were together, um, so it really shows the, the era, the design era of uh, cruise bags, um, which is really important to um, have found pieces from Pueblo. Um, and again, some of these items were from Pueblo. This this hat, this dress, um, and these pieces here are all from Pueblo. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this little timeline, um, illustrative timeline that I've presented to you in conjunction with our uh, new upcoming exhibit, Pueblo in the Warm Twenties. Um, and we invite you to view it. Um, please keep an eye on our website. Um, as to when the exhibit will be ready to present. And um, again, this is the first program of, of many affiliated with that exhibit. And we just come invite you to, uh, to be a part of it, to enjoy it. And I thank you for joining me.